connected. Um, I had a patient actually uh, with ALS, not with myositis, years ago, um, who ended up with a feeding tube. And her partner wanted to uh, write a cookbook about uh, food for people that had trouble swallowing. And she asked me to write the introduction, uh, which I did. And then the reason I wrote the introduction was that I had a feeding tube. So I think I'm one of the few myositis doctors that can say I lived with a feeding tube for about a year. So because of that, I keep giving this talk over and over again. Um, but it's actually, I think it's OK. So, um, so what's dysphagia? Dysphagia is, um, just means problem swallowing. Um, so there's, there's dysphagia, as we'll talk about, from lots of different diseases. There's nothing special about myositis that causes um, dysphagia. Um, and it usually leads to um, a few different problems. Um, the earliest is just kind of coughing and choking when you eat or drink. Um, and, and somewhat surprisingly, uh, liquids are actually much harder to swallow than solids. And most of you are shaking your head when you get that. Uh, and the reason we'll talk about it is that the solids are already kind of a, a thing. Um, and so it's not so hard to move a thing as opposed to moving liquid, which just sloshes um, all over the place. Um, so typically people will notice problems earliest um, with, with liquids. Um, some people will have trouble swallowing on saliva. So we make a lot of saliva throughout a day. Um, that usually leads then to frequent throat clearing um, because the saliva drips down onto the vocal cords or close to the vocal cords. Um, and then some people, when they talk, it just sounds like they're wet. Um, so it sounds like they're underwater a little bit. And again, that's because there's water on the vocal cords. So those are usually kind of the first signs of, of problems with swallowing. Um, not as commonly in myositis, but with some of the other diseases that, that cause dysphagia, eating more slowly um, tends to be another really common symptom. And so um, the person with dysphagia uh, will watch their spouse finish, and then they're at the table another 20 or 30 minutes because it just takes so long uh, with each bite um, to chew and to swallow and then to drink after each swallow, whereas most of us will you know, plow through 20 bites uh, before we drink something. Um, but, but that is actually more concerning. Um, and then the biggest issue really becomes weight loss. Um, and so probably our, our single biggest foe, uh, I was just in the last talk, someone said, you know, how do I maintain my strength? And I sort of somewhat facetiously said, well, be healthy. And then he said, well, what that mean? And I said, well, eat well and exercise. Um, and so the first thing is eating well. And so your muscles, more than any other cell in your body, uh, need constant energy. And so it takes about three days uh, if you go into the hospital and say you can't eat because you've got some GI problem and you're healthy. Nothing else wrong with you. But within three days, your muscles start to atrophy. Um, so your muscles are very, very sensitive to not having enough nutrition. Um, and so in, in our clinics and in most neuromuscular clinics and uh, myositis clinics, we follow weight very, very carefully. And, and the last thing we want to see is for someone to lose weight. So as I said, there's a lot of different causes um, for dysphagia. Uh, neuromuscular is not the most common. So the most common is actually people that have surgery up in here. Um, so esophageal cancer, laryngeal cancer, thyroid surgery, um, other types of things that just disrupt the mechanics of, of what's going on in the neck. And then stroke is actually very, very common. Um, I think a lot of us think about swallowing problems with stroke because stroke is so common and most of us have seen people that develop that after stroke. It's very different in, in myositis than in stroke. And, and the reason for that is in stroke, there's damage to the brain. And so as we'll talk about, the whole swallowing mechanism is really one of the most complicated things that we do. Um, and if the brain is not intact, then the brain can't sense all the problems as you go through all the stages that you go through in order to swallow. With myositis, hopefully, your brain's intact. Uh, and uh, therefore, when there's a problem, your brain very quickly tells you there's a problem and you cough or choke or do those kinds of things. With stroke, they don't swallow well and they don't cough or choke. And that's the worst because then the food goes into their lungs and that's what we're trying to protect. Um, and so you can see neuromuscular diseases of all, of all causes of dysphagia, it's only 6%. So it's not, if you start with swallowing problems, neuromuscular disease is rare. Um, but if you start with neuromuscular, myositis um, or neuromuscular diseases, about 30% of patients get dysphagia. So that's not rare. Um, so it depends on, on which way you start. So the two most common forms of myositis that cause dysphagia are IBM, uh, which is the most common, and then dermato. Um, it, it sometimes is the presenting symptom, meaning uh, particularly in IBM, 
Um, people just don't notice the limb weakness because it's so slowly, gradually progressive. But what brings them to the attention is they're coughing and choking, and that becomes um, obviously a problem. The other thing that's a challenge we were just mentioning is that sometimes in poly and dermatomyositis, we can treat the muscle disease really well, um, but we don't necessarily treat the swallowing with the same efficacy. Um, so there's sometimes a separation that will make the limb strength better, but the swallowing is still bad. Uh, it doesn't usually go the other way, but, but that can definitely happen as well. So, um, so we'll talk about sort of dysphagia itself and, and kind of the mechanism um, that's involved. But the, the thing that's really kind of important is, again, that we take this very, very seriously. And we take it seriously for a couple of reasons. One is weight loss is going to cause your muscles to be weaker. Just like if weight loss caused anyone else, or anyone else had weight loss, their muscles would get weaker too. Um, so we really don't want to have that. And so the neurologist or rheumatologist that you're seeing should pay a lot of attention and, and should um, you know, ask about these kinds of things as well. Um, this last point's a really good one. So if you're worried that you're having more choking or swallowing than the average bear, um, the easy test is just drink a glass of water, about six or eight ounces, and then talk. Um, it's what the speech therapists do at bedside in the hospital. Um, if you do that and it sounds wet, um, then you're not swallowing correctly. Um, that's good. Again, it's not 100% in either direction, but it's, it's a pretty easy test. Okay, so as I said before, swallowing is, I actually really enjoy getting referrals into my practice for uh, people that have swallowing problems because you basically can have anything wrong with you and have it lead to a swallowing problem. So it's kind of fun for us as neurologists. Um, and so you have to start by trying to figure out, is it a brain problem, right? Is it a nerve problem? Is it a muscle problem? Is it a problem with the connection between the nerve and the muscle? Any of those can cause um, swallowing problems. So uh, it's important to kind of understand uh, what's involved um, with swallowing. So um, there's sort of three phases if you think about it. One is your mouth. Uh, the second is the back of your mouth, which is the pharynx or the top of your throat. And then the third is down the esophagus. So we need those three parts of uh, the swallowing mechanism to take place. The slightly gross picture here, but so here's, you know, we talk about food as a bolus in swallowing, which is also gross, but um, so if you think about this, here's your head, here's, here's your food uh, inside um, your mouth. So there's the palate on the top there, there's the tongue there, and, and, and there's the food. And so what you've got to be able to do is to move that bolus uh, back there uh, and then down here. Um, and then this little device here called the epiglottis is what's designed to prevent that food from getting uh, into, the, uh, into the trachea, which would then go down to the lungs. So all of that sort of has to work together. As it does that, uh, the epiglottis will move and will cover. So here's the windpipe, the trachea, right? So you might do like an emergency tracheostomy that sits in the front. And then right behind that is the esophagus where the food goes. So this, this connection where the esophagus and the trachea come together is really the problem, okay? Um, and so the epiglottis is designed, when you swallow, to close off the airway. The trachea here is where your vocal cords are, okay? So if this food gets here, your last line of defense is that it irritates the vocal cords and you choke or cough, okay? So your vocal cords do not like to have food or water on them. So if you think about two lines of defense, you've got the epiglottis here, which is supposed to close off your airway, and then your vocal cords here, which are supposed to close off your airway. This sometimes is a problem, because if the food gets onto your vocal cords, they can go into spasm. Um, and if they go into spasm, you can actually die from that. Um, because then they, they actually will block off your airway, because they're trying to protect your airway, but they get overactive in that, and that's where you have to do a tracheostomy <laughs> and get below that level. So that's what happens here. If the food goes down the right pipe, then it goes into the esophagus, uh, and it goes down into the stomach. So uh, in the oral phase, uh, we've got um, two different ways to kind of look at that. The first are liquids. Um, so if a liquid goes into your mouth, um, all of us will agree, you can't really swallow a liquid if you keep your mouth open. Right? So you close your lips, and it keeps the liquid in, that's a good thing. Um, but that also serves then as the signal um, to allow you to kind of briefly move that packet of liquid um, back, um, and it happens before um, we start to swallow. One of the other earlier symptoms of dysphagia is that you may find people that have to swallow multiple times, um, and that's because they're not able to get that into the back of their mouth the way that they're supposed to, so they swallow, because there's a little bit of it that's there, but there's still more in the oral passageway. They swallow again, swallow again, swallow again. 
So multiple swallows is a way to kind of compensate for not being able to move that bolus into the back the way that you're supposed to. <coughs> um, if it's a solid food, um, then um, you would have to then do some kind of lateralization to be able to chew it. So now you're talking about moving that food. Most of us don't chew with our front teeth. So you have to move that food over to the side. Um, you have to be able to chew that food. And then you have to be able to move that food uh, into the back. Um, and then again, uh, the same with the solid foods. What's interesting about this, again, just to show you kind of how complex that is, you go, well, that doesn't sound all that difficult. But it's usually complicated because of the number of sensory nerves that are in your mouth, right? So think about what happens to your swallowing mechanism if you put something hot in your mouth, right? Then your brain won't let you swallow a burning cup of coffee, right? It's going to tell you that you can't do that. Or the same with freezing. Like you put a giant ice thing in your gut, and you can't swallow it. So all that sensory stuff is going on at the same time to kind of tell our brain what to do with that food and whether that food is safe to put into the back of our throat. Otherwise, you can't do it. It's very, very hard to overcome that, um, even if you wanted to. Um, then, again, that oral phase, if you think back to that picture, um, you've got to somehow get that food now into the back. Um, and so the tongue is hugely important here. Um, so the tongue's going to sort of lift up, and as the tongue lifts up, the food um, goes back to uh, the back of the throat. And then in the back of the throat, or the pharynx, um, is where the, really, where the uh, swallowing center is. So as that food gets delivered into the back of the throat, um, it now starts to talk to the brain, uh, we call the swallowing centers uh, in the brain, and then allows um, that packet of food to go back uh, towards the esophagus. And at the same time, talks to the epiglottis and tells the epiglottis to close off the airway. <coughs> this is where a lot of the trouble comes from, um, because these whole processes are very complicated. So you have to have a very rhythmic movement of the tongue to be able to push that food into the back of the throat. At the same time, you've got to be able to lift up the top, that soft palate part, to allow the food uh, to move into the back. And then you've got to be able to move the epiglottis over on top of the airway, um, and then you've got to allow the vocal cords to start to close um, to be able to swallow. So this is an incredibly complicated series of movements. And so you can see that if the brain's not working right, there's no way that's going to happen correctly. If the nerves can't send the right signals or you can't feel the right things that you're supposed to feel, because the, the, the brain has to feel all those movements to know what to do next. And then for you guys, what's most important is if the muscles are too weak to do it correctly, um, then you start to run into trouble. Um, in the back of that pharynx is what's called the cricopharyngeal muscle, and we'll talk about that a little bit, but that's the muscle that actually has to relax, because remember, if you think back to that picture, there's not much space back there between the epiglottis uh, and the, the trachea and the esophagus, and it's that cricopharyngeal muscle that sort of holds that all together. Um, so that muscle has to relax in order for the food to pass down and go into the esophagus. So sometimes we talk about kind of opening up uh, that muscle, cutting that muscle even, um, so that there's more space to get the food back there if the muscles are too weak to move it back correctly. Um, but then you get the food um, that goes into the esophagus. Um, this, we have this concept of what we call peristalsis, um, which is basically the movement of the muscles um, as it starts to go down uh, the esophagus into the stomach. <clears throat> and this is just sort of an important point to keep in mind. So there's three types of muscle in our body. Um, most of the muscle in our body is skeletal muscle. So when you have sinusitis, you damage the skeletal muscle. But there's cardiac muscle, which is your heart muscle. It's completely different. So 99.999% of the people with myositis don't have heart problems. Um, and then the third is smooth muscle. And the smooth muscle is the muscle of the intestines. Okay? So again, with myositis, you don't damage the smooth muscle or the cardiac muscle. So all of the trouble is really in the top half of the esophagus. Once you get the food down there into the second half of the esophagus, then it's smooth muscle and it's not really a problem. So again, this is a better look at the esophagus. Here's the trachea uh, kind of sitting in front of that. And you can see there's a, this is the smooth muscle. There's a layer that goes down this way, the muscle oriented, and then there's these circular layers around the esophagus as well. Uh, now all that's doing is squeezing and contracting um, as the food uh, moves down into the esophagus. You can have a number of problems in the esophagus. So I tell people with myositis all the time, just because you have dysphagia, remember only 6% of dysphagia is caused by myositis. 
There's lots of other reasons why you might have dysphagia. And so it's always important to get it evaluated correctly and make sure that, yeah, it really is the muscle disease and it's not something else. Because sometimes it is something else. So in this esophagus, you can sometimes have rings or, or strictures so that the food can't pass um, down the esophagus very well. So I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures this morning or this afternoon. Um, this, these are what's called this a modified barium swallow. So the patient will drink a liquid, uh, which is very radial opaque, so it shows up very, very white. So that's supposed to be a very smooth esophagus, and you can see how there's this ring indented. And so you can imagine that that's only half the, the size of the esophagus. If you have a big piece of food, it's going to get stuck there. Um, that's a very common uh, type of dysphagia that, that patients have. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. When you say get it evaluated correctly, so starting with the person who's taking care of your muscle disease is probably the best place to start. So a neurologist or a rheumatologist. Um, but the, the two ways, and, and well, the, the place usually we'll start, I think I'll have this later, is a, is, is a modified bearing swallow. I mean, it's getting to a speech pathologist, because there's a person that does that. Um, sometimes it also will mean endoscopy, where you see a GI doctor and they look down. But typically that's the two ways. But if you start with a modified bearing swallow, it's, it's easy. It's, you don't have to have anesthesia for it. I could say, like, I had the very swallow. Yeah. Do I need to go to him? Uh, if, the, if they thought yeah, it was fine. No, if they thought it was the muscle disease or they thought it was fine and they were following it, then probably not. Yeah, thank you. Um, here's sort of another uh, problem. So here's a, very, a modified very swallow kind of looking straight on. So the person's head is up here. Their stomach is down here. These are the lungs. So this is a person that's not <coughs> swallowing efficiently. So if you think about sort of the, the muscles in the center of your throat here, there's all this space out here. Um, so we talk about that as pocketing. Um, it's a big problem in myositis because again, we're not, you're not swallowing the food efficiently and the food stays up there. So here you've got pocketing where the person swallowed, but it's stuck up in their space. Okay, so we can see that. That's not necessarily a big problem, but now look at their lungs. So all of that stuff then slowly dribbles down over time and ends up in their lungs. Um, and that's going to cause a pneumonia or kill them. Um, so that, that's really what we can get concerned about. So it's not only a matter of saying, are you swallowing enough to maintain your nutrition? But it's also, are you swallowing enough to make sure that this isn't happening, where it's, it's dribbling down into the lungs over time? What would be the first signs? Uh, so again, multiple swallows would probably be the first sign. Um, and then, unfortunately, sometimes the first sign is aspiration. Um, so here's again another example. Um, here you can see um, an outline of this big muscle. So that's the cricopharyngeal muscle. And as they're swallowing, um, the food is kind of being diverted in this way. You can see it again on the side here. So that's an example where the doctor might go in and cut that muscle, um, which would then allow the food to kind of drain through there um, a little bit more efficiently. And then this is the lower part of the esophagus, just a normal example. So here's the food coming down. Uh, the esophagus, and then it's entering the stomach here. And, and there's a lot, I mean, you know, half of the world um, has what's called gastroesophageal reflux. Okay, I don't know why all of a sudden we all have that, but... Um, <laughs> so there's a sphincter down here, and that sphincter is supposed to keep all the acid that's in your stomach in your stomach. For some reason, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, evolution. Uh, um, but, uh, so now we said lots of people where this just kind of goes up. Um, not really dysphagia per se, which is a very common uh, problem. And so the stomach, um, its purpose is basically a food reservoir. Is, is there a danger in that bird coming up uh, and getting you know, into the uh, trachea? Uh, not commonly. So it can happen. So that, in, in sort of the healthy population, without muscle disease or a swallowing problem that has GERD, that doesn't really happen significantly. Um, if those muscles up here are weak, there is a little bit of risk, but if it happens, it happens at night. Um, so when you're sleeping, right, so if you've, got, if you've got reflux, but now you're horizontal, and then your swallowing mechanisms up here aren't good, and it does reflux into the back of your throat while you're asleep, that may then go down into the stomach. If you actually study normal people without reflux and without muscle disease, we all aspirate a little bit at night. Um, so we all do that. 
Um, so it's just a question kind of how much. So we tend not to overly worry about that because it's such a common thing anyway. Um, so that's, that's lower down our list of things to worry about. Um, so again, so this is the stomach holds the food. The stomach has a bunch of digestive enzymes that allow us to digest the food, and then the stomach uh, pushes it out. Um, so this is the, the stomach here. This is that um, uh, sphincter that I was talking about that's supposed to kind of hold it in place. Um, and then uh, this is um, the diaphragm. So probably a lot of people also have what's called hiatal hernias. Also, I'm not sure what that is. Now everybody has that. But <laughs> a uh, hiatal hernia is where the stomach sits above the diaphragm. Um, so that, that's, that's what that means. And again, that diaphragm is supposed to help keep all the stomach stuff in the stomach. And so if the tip of the stomach is above the diaphragm, then that sphincter is even higher, and then that doesn't work well. And so you get more reflux. Otherwise, hiatal hernia is not a huge thing to worry about. Um, but again, I don't know, 20% of us have that now too. Uh, so this is that gastroesophageal reflux that I thought I had the slide. So here's the stomach, uh, here's the sphincter, here's the esophagus. If you did, this is an endoscopy, so they go down in your esophagus with a camera, looks nice and healthy. Uh, here's one not so healthy, you can see all these erosions. Um, and, and A, that hurts, um, so you're literally burning your esophagus with acid, that doesn't feel good. Um, but the bigger concern is that over time that causes cancer. Um, so there's a syndrome called Barrett's esophagus. Um, that there's a very high risk of cancer if you don't treat that. So uh, when it's that bad, it has to be treated aggressively. Okay, so how do we evaluate swallowing? So again, I talked about the bedside, just drink a glass, um, see if your voice um, sounds wet. Um, the, um, there is um, endoscopy, um, so that's a fees, so fibroscopic endoscope. So just have the doctor look down, um, make sure there's no strictures, make sure that the anatomy is healthy, um, and uh, then the modified bearing <coughs> swallow. Really, in myositis, the modified bearing swallow, as I said, is the place to start. Um, it's going to give us the best look um, as to what's going on with the muscles. And, and really, it allows you to evaluate everything. Is, it, is it the bolus formation correct? Is the peristalsis correct? Is the movement correct? Is there aspiration? It's cheap, it's easy, it's still actually the, the best test that we have. Uh, oh, um, okay, so the two biggest risks, as I said, for dysphagia is, is weight loss and aspiration. Um, that's really what we worry about. So. Um, there are a number of, of factors that increase the risk for aspiration in, in anybody. So um, that, that's kind of on this list. So neuromuscular diseases obviously increases the risk. Um, simply being older, um, swallowing becomes less efficient as we get older. 80 year olds don't swallow the same way that 20 year olds do. Um, and sort of these other conditions as well. Um, and then a bunch of mechanical issues. So have they had abdominal surgery? Um, have they had previous intubations, tracheostomies? Um, those type of disorders as well. Um, and then aspiration is not great. Um, so again, we all probably aspirate a little bit all the time. Um, we just, this is what we do. Um, but if you aspirate enough, and particularly enough of something toxic enough, um, it, that's bad. Um, so it's not necessarily just like treating pneumonia, take some blood and put it home and you're fine. Um, you could be intubated for weeks and weeks uh, in the ICU. Um, it's, it's, it's a bad deal. So, and people do die from aspiration. Um, so, uh, we, we want to avoid that, obviously, um, if at all possible. So, there's a whole range of, of, of aspiration. So, aspiration simply means that you're penetrating that upper layer of the esophagus. So, um, as I said, uh, yeah, half of all normal subjects aspirate in our sleep. So, it's not that we don't do it, but we just do little bits of it. And, and that's okay. <laughs> um, okay, so there's a lot of different causes of dysphagia. And so I think in, in a lot of neurology patients, when I s start to hear symptoms of swallowing problems and I say, you know, we need to get you to a speech therapist, the patient's mind immediately jumps to a feeding tube and they're like, I don't want a feeding tube, so I'm not going to go to the speech therapist. I get nobody wants a feeding tube. Um, on the other hand, there's a lot of different ways for us to treat dysphagia um, that don't necessarily involve a feeding tube. We can't know how to treat it until we know what the problem <coughs> is. So that first test is really simple and easy. Um, and if there's any problems, you, you should go get that. So there are simple things like um, it's hard for the patient to, to form that initial bolus. And so you can teach people to put the food further back in their mouth um, before they start to even think about swallowing. 
Um, we talked about the pocketing. Um, there actually are exercises. We talked about the vital stem. It's a really um, probably one of the best studied um, forms for the vital stem is to help with that pocketing problems. Um, we can obviously change um, the, the texture of the food if swallowing is too difficult. Um, this is a really important one. So as the tongue gets weak, um, it becomes very difficult to swallow. And probably one of the single best things that help is to swallow with a chin tuck. Um, so it just helps move that tongue and it helps open up the airway and it's incredibly simple um, and, and can be unbelievably helpful for people. Um, people that have a delayed swallow um, actually changing the temperature of the food. Remember we talked about the fact that those sensory nerves um, have to trigger the, si the signals in the brain. So sometimes you can find that hotter or colder foods can actually kind of be a stronger stimulus to tell um, the brain what to do. The people that have the multiple swallows, we like to educate them about alternating liquids and solids. It takes a long time, but it's unbelievably helpful. So you eat a bite of a solid food, you take a drink. You eat a bite of a solid food, you take a drink. What the drink is doing is helping get that food down so you don't have to swallow four or five, six times um, to try to get that food down. Getting out of the habit of what we all do, which is you know, 20 bites and then I take a drink. Um, so uh, that's, again, usually helpful. People that have a lot of the kind of coughing and clearing when they eat, um, sometimes, again, can benefit just from changing um, the texture of their food. Um, and then the last example is if it really is penetrating um, all the way to the level of the vocal cords, um, then the person has to stop eating. Okay, but this is really only an extreme case. In most of these other cases are things that you work with the speech therapist, um, and they can really make a huge difference. And one of the nice things about the modified bearing, the ones that I work with, is again, like say they're going to teach you how to do a chin tuck. They can show you how bad your swallow is when you drink the barium. Then you do the chin tuck and you see how much better your swallow is. It's, a, it's like, wow, it's just a bell goes off in your head. Um, and it really can be helpful. So we, we love speech therapists. Um, so this is, again, just sort of an example of um, what aspiration would look like. So here's the esophagus, here's the trachea. So the person's got the bolus, it's supposed to be going this way. Uh, the pharynx is not doing what it's supposed to, it goes down here. Um, so during it, you've got some that's going in the esophagus, some that's going into the vocal cords, still a little bit left in the back of the tongue, uh, and then it comes down here. If it penetrates the level of the vocal cord, then the person will cough. Uh, I'm wondering, I find that sometimes when I'm talking, my tongue will like shoot to the side and I'll bite it. <clears throat> Yes. Is that part of the dysphagia? Yeah. So that's a very common problem. No, um, it's really I don't know annoying. that it's so much that your tongue is shooting to the side. It may be, but it probably is more weakness of those muscles. So again, if you think about how your jaw has to be aligned when you're chewing, and how much space there is between your tongue and your teeth, right. there's almost no space. So if your muscles are weak and you allow the jaw to move, I think it's more the jaw that's probably moving, but it could be either. Well, I mean, either the, way can do it. the other thing I noticed is that Sometimes my bottom jaw will like, go up and down yeah. one or two times before it happens. <laughs> but it happens so fast that you know it's not like you can grab yeah, it. And it's stop. a very common problem with dysphagia and really painful and annoying. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. the, the constant biting of your tongue. Yeah. Are you saying that when we talk, if it's a wet talk, that definitely means we're good as we're over or Yes. Um, so that was aspiration uh, during swallowing, um, but you can also aspirate before swallowing. Again, if the muscles are so weak, here the bolus of the food is way up at the top of their tongue, or the front of their tongue, um, so they haven't even begun to swallow yet, but they've got such poor control of the back that it's already going down into their esophagus. Um, so it doesn't, you don't have to just aspirate when you're trying to swallow. Um, again, here's another example of aspirating when you swallow. So most of the food goes down uh, the esophagus, some of the food is going in the front, uh, down the trachea. Uh, I'm sure I should do that one. That's the kind of pocketing in the sinuses and then the food going down. Okay, <clears throat> so how do we treat that? Um, so again, there are lots and lots of non-surgical ways to treat aspiration. Um, so exercises, uh, vital stim, um, anything that we can do to, to retrain the muscles that work. Um, so even though you've got aspiration, which means some of the muscles are not working correctly, there are lots and lots of muscles that do work correctly. And the muscles that do work correctly can get stronger. So exercises can be very helpful. Okay. 
that last slide you talked about the pocket again, just yeah. quickly mentioned for, for about sinuses. If you have sinus issues, how much is that complicated? Right. This whole thing? It's not the same. Yeah. So we call these the sinuses, but this is actually down here. It's just a sinus just means a space. Okay. Um, so it's not connected to the sinuses so up here. Not good. Some people, uh, so the only exception is if you've got <coughs> bad sinuses and a lot of drainage, yeah. um, then that can definitely make this worse because you'll aspirate, just like you can aspirate on your saliva, you can aspirate on those secretions. <coughs> yeah. Kind of a two-part question. This chin pocket. Yeah. You're literally talking about taking a bite. Yep. Maybe taking a drink yep. and then tip your head up. Yep. Okay, That's secondly, good. which liquid? I always use water like you're talking about. Yeah. A friend just told me about <coughs> works much better with milk. So milk is thicker than water. So the thinner the liquid, the harder it is to swallow. Um, there is stuff that you can buy called thickener or thickening. Um, so you can take water, uh, and I think it's a gelatin kind of stuff, and you can make it different consistencies of thickness. And so that way you can drink water um, more easily. So the water is the hardest thing to drink. Milk has got a little more substance to it, so it's a little easier to drink. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so again, we talked about the chin tuck. Chin tuck is not necessarily always the right position for people. So depending on where your weakness is, again, what the speech therapist can do is they can say well, maybe it's better if you turn to the right or turn to the left or what you what you can do. So they can really try to find ways to allow. All you're trying to do is to align up. If this is your tongue and this is your esophagus, you're trying to get that into alignment <laughs> so that the muscles don't have to work as hard to move the food. Um, and so they can do a really good job that way. Um, I have not seen lying on your side work. I should take that out. Um, but uh, <laughs> upright, yeah, I, don't, I don't know where that came from. Um, but upright, again, is usually important. So a lot of people over the years, you know, they'll eat dinner at you know, a 30 degree incline in bed. That's a horrible idea. Okay? If you have trouble swallowing, you need to be upright. Um, so, but sometimes it's just simple things like that to kind of re educate sort of, of how people do. Um, and then obviously um, dietary changes. Um, so we talked about that muscle. Oh, sorry. Is, there, uh, is it better to go to the left or the right? I heard people say something about that. So yeah, everybody's different. Um, so it just sort of depends on which muscles are more affected. And some of the stroke patients, um, very often it's kind of towards the side of the weakness. But um, I, I don't like to kind of guess, even the chin tuck. I don't like to tell somebody to do a chin tuck unless they work with a speech pathologist because you may be making it worse. You don't really know. And again, it's not, it's an hour test, it's easy, and then you really know the right thing, so. Um, so sometimes those muscles, the, the cricopharyngeal muscles, um, are, become a problem. Um, and so again, you've got, you've got this kind of, if you think about a funnel, right, your mouth at the top of your throat is kind of a funnel, and you're trying to get to a smaller tube at the bottom to get it into the esophagus. And so the muscle that sort of forms that rim at the top of the funnel, or you know, the base of the funnel, um, is the cricopharyngeal muscle. Um, and if you think about it again, trying to just line that up to make the food easier to go down, um, there are some people where cutting that muscle uh, surgically um, can open up that funnel and it's just easier to get the food down. Um, it often will heal and scar back up, so it's not necessarily permanent, but I've seen many people that, that have had benefit from it. Um, and so again, usually working with the, the GI doctor and the, the speech therapist, you can get a sense of is that likely to work, and again, they can tell. Right? If the problem's in the front of your mouth, cutting this muscle is not going to do any good. Um, so looking at where, where the food is getting held up and then what changes you can make to kind of help with that really is important. Uh, um, there's this device called Vital Stem, which was approved about 15 years ago. Um, there have been a couple of small studies that have um, looked at trying to stimulate the muscles up here to see whether we can strengthen them. Again, the idea being that exercise um, may be beneficial. Um, and uh, so it's, it's definitely something that's, that's nice um, to try. Most of the data for vital stem really comes from stroke patients. And so I, tr I spent a few years back, I spent a good deal of time trying to look um, at, at this data. And it's a little bit hard because stroke patients recover anyway. Um, and a lot of the studies that were really positive were taking patients early after a stroke. And so it's hard to know them because they may have gotten better um, anyway. Um, but it, it's, again, I think it's a very reasonable thing to do. Um, they um, had very few patients in their literature that's been studied for myositis. So out of about 900 patients that they submitted to the FDA, only eight of them um, had myositis. 
Um, but again, I, I'm not I'm, I'm not opposed to it. Patients that ask for it, I certainly um, have them try it. And I have a number of patients that do it on their own, and they think it's, it's been helpful. So I think it's a nice non-surgical thing to think about doing. Um, the, the last issue from a surgical standpoint are feeding tubes. Um, so one of the things I, I try to make clear, I think a lot of people have the concept that, that sort of feeding tubes are like an end of life thing. Uh, and um, that once I get a feeding tube, I can never eat again. Uh, and, and none of those things are true. Okay? Um, so uh, they may be true for some people, but they're not true in myositis. Um, so in myositis, the whole goal of a feeding tube is to keep you stronger. Okay? And you can't be stronger if you're not getting enough nutrition. Um, so that's the purpose of a feeding tube. You can still eat whatever you want safely, okay? But the point is, if you're losing weight with myositis, then you're not eating enough food safely. So say you're getting a thousand calories a day now, and that's not enough food for you. Well, keep eating your thousand calories a day now, because you're doing that, you know, in the hospital with aspiration pneumonia. But we'll give you another thousand calories a day, so you're stronger. So to me, it's really a supplement. There are very few, in fact, I don't think we have any myositis patients who have ever only been fed by a feeding tube. So you can still eat whatever you want with a feeding tube. I was on feeding tube. I was on feeding tube. I went 15 months just on feeding tube. I still have the feeding tube. Yeah. But I, and it's for a supplement. But yeah. I, I hate having to do that. I enjoy eating, so I'm going to try hard. Yeah. yeah. It's stubborn. Yeah, yeah. Losing well, and so that, but that's exactly the point. The point is, we eat for two reasons. We eat because it's fun, right? It tastes good. It's a social, good. It's a yeah. social thing. Yeah, and then we eat for nutrition. So what the feeding tube does is to separate those two things, right? So you still eat whatever you can that's fun, but if it's taking an extra hour to eat breakfast and your whole family's left the table and you're by yourself trying to force down some oatmeal, that's not fun anymore, right? So forget that. Eat for as long as you want, then stop it, then get the calories that you need extra in the easiest way possible. What are the risks of surgery? Of the feeding tube? No, the cryo... Oh, I mean, there's not much risk, actually. Um, so, I mean, infection, you know, leading the typical kind of surgery risks, but there's not a ton of risk to the myotomy. And it's not really a permanent fix, it's just a... My, so, some of the surgeons say it's a permanent fix. Almost everybody I've ever sent. Uh, within three to five years, it's back again. Is there a... Um, should you wait longer to have the <coughs> surgery, or does it matter when you have the surgery? Uh, the myotomy of this muscle? Yeah. Probably doesn't matter. I mean, so to me, again, you, you don't want to wait to the point that you're losing weight. So if you're not losing weight and you can stand the swallowing problems that you have, there's no reason to do anything. All right, I've already dropped 10 pounds, but I've stayed at that. Yeah, so that's probably okay. Okay. Um, I dropped 70. Yeah, that's not okay. <laughs> <laughs> How about the ballooning procedure? Uh, the dilatation? Yeah, um, what is the difference? I mean, when do you know whether you need ballooning versus surgery? So the ballooning is very temporary. Um, well, there's two types. There's ballooning of the esophagus. So many, again, many, many people have those strictures that I showed you, uh, and that's what we tend to that's use the I ballooning mean. for. Um, that's not so much related to the myositis. That's yeah. just sort of a esophageal stricture problem. Um, there's not much risk of ballooning at all, which is nice, but it's very temporary. Uh, six months a year or something like that. Um, some people try doing dilatation up higher. I don't think it works very well. Are you, are you saying that the stricture of the esophagus is not really tolerable. <coughs> no, well, there's two. So there's this, the, the stricture of the muscle up here, which is the cricopharyngeal muscle, yeah. and then there's esophageal strictures. Okay. The esophageal strictures are not caused by myositis. Okay. That's just a, again, that's just a common okay. problem that people have. Yeah. Um, this muscle, hard to know exactly, um, but it, it probably, it's probably nothing directly related to the myositis either. Hmm. How about the zinkers? Yeah, so yeah, uh, zinkers diverticulum is another problem that people have in the stomach. We tend, unless that's a real big, really big air problem, we tend to leave that alone. What, what was that? There's a thing called the zinkers diverticula. It's basically an outpocketing of the esophagus or the stomach. Um, it causes food to kind of hang up there as well. Uh, but it's, it's low enough down that we tend not to 
overly <coughs> worry about that with aspiration. Okay, but is that is the result of the myositis or something else? That's something else, yeah, yeah. Okay, because... Yeah, again, these are all common. That's why I say it's really important to get this evaluated because if it's one of these other things, these are just common GI problems that people have not related to the myositis. And, you know, your doctor could think, oh, you've got more swallowing problems or more choking problems, and we're going to give you more prednisone to treat, you know, an esophageal stricture, which has got nothing to do with the myositis. So it is important to get it looked into and know really what you're dealing with. Could you comment on that? What I experienced is like white color, like a pooling of saliva. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> okay. Well, so that, that's why does it it's, go down? Is it's because it? you're swallow you're not swallowing efficiently. So when we swallow our saliva, <coughs> health, if a healthy person swallows their saliva, we get all the saliva down in one swallow. Maybe sometimes two. If you can only get half of that saliva down, it's always there. Uh, and you're always clearing your throat, you're always wet. Yeah. Yeah. Well I got evaluated recently for um, coloration. The doctor I went to last, he said, okay, we've got a picture of the oral down to your pharyngeal. But that doesn't tell me what I need to know to go on to do the ventilation. I need to go below the pharyngeal, see what's happening below that. So they did a full ventilation. And from that, then he said, you're not a candidate. Does that sound? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's a modified variant swallow which looks at basically up through here, and then it was called an upper GI, uh, which then just follows it down. Yeah. Same. Same test, basically, just how long they look and how much you swallow. <coughs> but if it's IBM related, it's going to be kind of more over the corrosion. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the dilatations are not usually all that useful for the myositis. The dilatations would be for the stricture. So to do that, you'd have to look down. What he was trying to say is, is there something else we can do to improve the swallowing because we can't make the muscle stronger? Or we don't have any specific treatment for the muscle. Is a videophoroscopy the same thing as varying the swallow? Yes. Okay. And why not you want me to have the endoscopy first? But you're saying, you know, do the other thing. I mean, yes, yeah, so it's hard. In an individual person, and maybe he's more suspicious of something else going on, or, I mean, neither are wrong. But I'm okay to tell him I want to do Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I noticed that there seems to be a couple of particular items that I really enjoy eating that more times than not will cause uh, an excess amount of, for lack of a better term, foam in my mouth. Is it because of the food or is it some mechanical reaction? Probably both. Oh. So there are definitely people you know, that will say certain types of foods are harder to swallow. Um, certain types of foods can make your mouth drier or wetter. Um, and then if you're having trouble swallowing, you're not able to handle that. I think it's probably a combination of both, I guess. Um, okay, so the, from a the, uh, feeding tube standpoint, um, again, number one, patients can still eat whatever they can safely orally. Um, you can remove it. I have mine nine months. You take it out. It's no problem. Yours will be out soon. Uh, it's, it's actually incredibly safe uh, and, and really uh, easy to use. Um, there's a number of different... Oh, sorry. I, I've never seen someone with a but can you see the... I'll show you some pictures. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you can see it, yeah. Show and tell. To look at you, I would never right, right, right. That's right. So you can go to a restaurant and eat, and nobody knows you have it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's a number of different types of tubes. Um, there are uh, oral and nasal tubes. Um, these are really very short term. And the problem with these tubes is that the sinuses, the actual sinuses, are right here. And these tubes tend to really irritate the sinuses. So we can leave these in for a, a week, uh, maybe two. So if you get hospitalized, you're really sick. People will put this down. Um, the tube then goes all the way down into the stomach. Uh, in some cases, they'll pass the tube all the way into the first part of the intestines. Um, the other way around that then is to bypass this because this is uncomfortable to have a tube in the back of your throat. Um, so we have a gastrostomy tube, which is a little tube, I think that's what you have, uh, that goes right into the stomach. 
uh, and then you can also have a gene genostomy too, um, which will go into the intestine, uh, depending on whichever the doctor um, thinks that you need. Um, again, the nasogastric tube really for short-term um, issues. Um, these are kind of what the um, enterostomies are. Again, there's the gastrostomy uh, and the gene genostomy. Um, so the gastrostomy goes into the stomach, uh, and you just have a little button or a little tube um, that comes out. Um, the tubes kind of look like this. Uh, so this would be inside. Um, you've got ports uh, on the outside. Um, you connect those to, I'll show you in a second, some device that then allows the person to be fed. Um, this is kind of what they look like. So they're um, the tubes that kind of come out, and as you see yours, and then there's these things that we call Mickeys. Uh, Mickeys just have a kind of a little button like that uh, without any tube on the outside. Um, I worry about your tubes, the nasal or the stomach or the intestine. So the nasal basically we choose just sort of in the case of we need to do something now. Um, like if I have to, for some reason I have to get you medicines or feed you today, uh, and you're unconscious in the hospital, we put the nasal one in. Um, if it's clear that you're going to need that for a week or two, uh, or more than a week or two, uh, then we would put the one in the stomach. The one into the intestine, we pretty much only use unless a person, we use that only if a person has problems with their stomach. So say uh, they've got a ton of reflux, uh, or their stomach doesn't work for some reason. Um, then we just put the food directly into the uh, intestines. The disadvantage of putting it into the intestines um, is that the intestines can't uh, stretch as much as the stomach does. So when we eat, obviously our stomachs get huge. Um, they're designed to do that. So you can put a bunch of food in there, right? Uh, eat two or three times a day. If you feed into the intestines, you have to feed very little amounts uh, frequently. Is it different types or forms of food beyond that? I mean, yeah. it's digested or yeah. in the stomach. So, well, it's a, yeah, so most of the foods that we use, so most of the people that have feeding tubes, uh, as opposed to the cookbook that I mentioned, um, we'll use just formulas. So Ensure, Jevity, you know, there's about 50 of them. Um, with those, most of those can go into the small intestine and be fine because there's no digestion. Um, some people will like to take their food. Uh, so I'm making myself a hamburger. My wife is the feeding tube. I just blend up the hamburger and I put it in her feeding tube. Um, that's perfectly fine too. To me, that's just a lot of extra work and you don't taste it anyway. Uh, and with the feed of the formulas, you get all the right nutritions and balance of everything. So why do I go through the extra work of doing that? But there are some people that kind of like to do that. I've had patients like to put scotch down their feet too. That's fine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's going in their stomach, but it's the same thing. So uh, <laughs> nothing wrong with it. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's really fine. Yeah. You know, so you don't get that taste, but you still get the effect. So. Uh, Okay, so again, bolus feedings is what we just mentioned, which is what we use for feeding into the stomach. So it's a large amount of food. It's the way that we typically eat, so that's the way our intestines are used to it. We eat three or four times a day. That's a bolus, breakfast bolus, lunch bolus. Um, and, uh, so that, that works um, very well. Uh, again, the advantage is it's more physiologic, um, and you don't have to have any kind of special equipment for it. So if you're doing bolus feeding, this is what it looks like. Um, so a person's tube is under their shirt, um, nobody knows they have it when it's time for them to eat. Um, they take a big syringe or a bag, uh, they hook it up. Um, when I had mine, my kids were little, they used to fight over who could feed dad. Uh, but, I mean, a five-year-old can do it. There's, there's, there's nothing involved in doing this whatsoever. Um, there's a little more risk with aspiration this way. Again, you're putting a bunch of food in the stomach all at once. So you need to be upright, you don't want to lay down after you know, a liter of uh, food is going to your belly. Um, but, um, but really, this is the way that 99% of people are fed with feeding tubes. Um, you usually start kind of a low dose, um, gradually increase. Um, the continuous feedings, again, are more for people that, that really have a bad stomach for some reason. Um, so if the stomach can't hold 500 cc's or a liter, um, then you can do it continuously. I have some people that are just really busy during the day, and they don't want to stop twice, three times a day to do their feedings. Um, so they can hook this up at night, um, be fed 8 to 12 hours while they sleep at night, and then they don't have to worry about it during the day. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to sort of do this, uh, depending on what people prefer. Are they feel hungry? What's that? Are they not going to feel hungry? You know, so again, if they're getting the same number of calories, not typically much. And again, with, say with myositis where I do this, they're still eating little bits during the day anyway. 
right? So if you're hungry and you want to eat something that you can safely eat, and so we'll we'll work with the speech therapist and we'll say, okay, water not a great idea, but you know, um, whatever, you know milkshakes or uh, smoothies, um, you know, those kinds of things are a lot easier to swallow. Um, so you can do those when you're hungry. So they'll do that during the day. They get their main nutrition at night. Um, so it's, it gives you, again, it's a tremendous amount of flexibility with the feeding tube. Um, and, and we just kind of individualize it to each person, um, to how they're going to tolerate the best, what they like the best. There's lots of options of how to do this. Um, so most people are really very, very happy with them. I'm sorry, could you go back one, yeah. one slide? Oh, sure. Forward one. You said it's high fat, so what would happen if that's then, then you would do a low fat one. Yeah, there's, there, right, there's a million. Yeah, so there's most of them actually are relatively high sugar. Um, so we have diabetics where you have to go to a low sugar formula. I mean, Nestle's makes like $20 billion a year on these things. They're one of the biggest producers of these. So they have formulas for everything. So high fat, low fat, high sugar, low sugar, high protein, higher caloric levels where uh, if you can't deal with the volume, you can get more calories in the same amount of volume. Um, yeah, everything. <clears throat> um, so with the, again, with the continuous feedings, um, the biggest disadvantage is that you're, you kind of can't get around um, when you're hooked up, because now you are kind of hooked up like, it's not an IV pole, but it looks just like an IV pole. Um, but again, if you're doing that at night or when you're sleeping, um, then it's not really um, much of an issue. Um, most people don't need 24-hour infusion. So most of the time, 8 to 12 hours, I could get in 1,500 calories in the room really easily, and, uh, and they tolerate that well. Um, it is a little more expensive because you have to have a little equipment, whereas with the regular tube feedings, you don't equipment really well. Um, all right, so as I said before, the, the thing to kind of keep in mind about this, nobody, again, nobody wants a feeding tube, and people want to get them out once they have them. I certainly wanted to get mine out. Um, so I'm not advocating that we all run and go get them. Um, but on the other hand, I think most people delay way too long. Um, and, and so it's very difficult to get weight back on. Um, it's much easier to maintain weight. Um, and so, you know, that 10 to 15% of your body weight is kind of my threshold. Um, if you've fallen below that level, it's really time to start to think about the feeding tube. Um, once you start to think about the feeding tube, I tell people there's kind of two decisions. One is, am I ever going to get a feeding tube in this disease? Okay, so let's take IBM, for example. Um, at least today, unfortunately, we don't have a way to fix IBM. So if you're at the point where you say, I probably need to get a feeding tube, you have to say, do I want it, or am I going to you know, not do it, pass away you know, very thin, um, and probably be a little weaker than I should have been because I didn't get enough nutrition. If the decision is no, I'll get a feeding tube when I need it, then the answer is you need it. Okay. Um, so to me, it's two steps. If, you, if, you, if I'm your doctor and you tell me I will never get a feeding tube, that's perfectly fine. I will maintain and manage you and do everything I can so you don't need a feeding tube. But if you say to me, no, I, I'll get a feeding tube when I need it, and I say to you, well, you lost 20% of your body weight, the answer is you need it now. Okay. Um, and so that's, that's the kind of the two steps for me. And then, again, keep in mind, you can still eat. And again, I think there's this huge misconception that you can't eat with a feeding tube. The only question is, we just have to figure out what you can eat safely. Um, and then you can do whatever you want with that. <coughs> um, again, and they're really cheap. I mean, the procedure to put one in takes literally about less than 10 minutes. It's, it's just amazing. So almost everybody now does it through endoscopy. So they put the tube down into your stomach, just like they were doing the endoscopy for you. Uh, and then they just poke a hole. Uh, it's just going to go from your stomach out. Um, and that's how they make the hole. It takes them 10 minutes. It's incredibly fast. Um, they will lie to you, so I tell everybody. Um, the GI doctors all tell you it doesn't hurt. Uh, that's a lie. Uh, so, someone just poked a hole through your stomach. That hurts. Uh, but only for about three days. Okay? It really means so your, your stomach muscles are very, very sore because you have a hole in them uh, for about three days. That's fine. Um, so, uh, yeah, and then again, um, after it heals up, um, so I mean yours is well healed, um, you can swim, you can shower, you can do anything you want to do um, with it. So it really doesn't hinder you. And as you know, it goes under the shirt, so nobody knows that you have it um, unless they want to. 
So the idea is just to really get you as much nutrition as possible um, with as little risk as possible. And the problem is, what happens is, the greatest risk is trying to eat when you can't swallow well, when you're tired or weak. Okay, so when you try to push yourself to get enough calories in, that's when you're getting tired or weak. That's when you're going to aspirate. So I want you to eat until you get to that point, and then have the feeding tube to get nutrition after that point, because that's, that's the safe way to do it. So it is a common complication, um, but again, it's really treatable. Uh, so nobody really should have a problem with it, hopefully. Um, but you do have to tell your docs about it um, and if they're not asking you questions. Um, and, and really, I mean, the aspiration will be obvious because you'll be very sick in the hospital and people will yell at you for aspirating. Um, but uh, the weight loss is really the thing to pay attention to. Um, and you know, neurologists, rheumatologists don't really routinely check body weight uh, as much as PCPs do. And if you only see your PCP once a year, uh, you may not know that it's happening. So I tell people, really, once a week, you should weigh yourself. And if you start to see it slipping, then we have to do something. Great. Questions? More questions? Or food. Okay. Yeah. So does the Heimlich maneuver help? No. If someone asks for it? So the Heimlich is um, for when food is blocking the airway. Okay. And so that, that is a form of aspiration, but that's really choking because you'll die unless you fix that. So that's what the Heimlich is for. One, one thing to take home is if, you're, if, you, if you or your family member has problems swallowing, the thing to pay attention to when they're choking is are they making sound? Okay. So if they're making a sound while they're choking, leave them alone. Right. They will fix it. Okay. Um, when they're choking and not making a sound, that means that airway is completely blocked off, and that's where you do the Heimlich. The aspiration I'm referring to is when the fruit of the liquid gets into the lungs, so it's past the vocal cord. Um, and um, where are the vocal cords? The vocal cords, if you feel your trachea, yeah. it's right below that. Below it? Right. Okay. So if you do a tracheotomy, where do you do it? You're going further below the vocal cords than that. So you've got the, tra the vocal cords here, and then the trachea, the tracheostomy there. If you do your Adam's apple, what is that? The Adam's apple is kind of the, the tip of that. So figure your vocal cords, if you go that way, the vocal cords are just above that, and then where you do the tracheostomy is just below that. That's a bone. It's a cartilage. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's, it's not a bone. It's, it's hard, but it's not a bone. <laughs> I'm realizing what you say about IVIG. Mm. I've been using prednisone for a long time. Yeah. yeah. So people have studied IVIG in all the different <coughs> forms of myositis. Again, we're doing a trial now with um, uh, Octopharma to try to prove that it works. Hopefully it works. It does. Um, so for IVM, there's no proof that there's any treatment that works. But the one thing that there's kind of more little series of than others is that IVIG seems to help with dysphagia and IVM. So it's often very difficult to get insurance to cover. Um, What's the evidence for that? A number of small, like, case series. But, <coughs> so um, Delacus at the NIH did one. Um, Angle did one, um, so uh, where they would test like 10 to 15 patients. So it's not the most scientific of studies. But there are a number of small studies that seem to say that the dysphagia and IV, IVM gets better. Than yes. Um, some of your slides in the past, I, I, things were rare. My my situation, I have polymyositis, but it's with connective, and it is so much overlapping. I also have Barrett's. Um, esophageal, and lately it has become a bear. Yeah. And two weeks we're going to do another endoscopic and three other procedures. But one of the most recent things that are concerning me is when I um, intake food, and it could be 15 minutes, let's say, and the remainder of the food, the entire meal returns, even with medication. Um, Sometimes, even if the esophagus becomes extremely dry, it is very irritated, very painful. Yeah. Um, in situations like mine, and as you mentioned, it's rare, but heart is a part problem too. So Biostim <laughs> is not applicable to me unless there's something else out there, because I have a loop recorder and you can't have that. Um, what would you suggest in the, in the mere fact of a meal? It was stated earlier to me today that instead of having a per se true meal, 
just break it up into multiple, multiple meals. Yeah. I've done the the um, alternating of the drinking. I've done everything I can possibly do without yeah. actually opening up here and see what's truly going on. <laughs> Is the Barons getting well beyond where I thought it was? or what is really going on, and would a feeding tube be applicable in the future? With prednisone, of course, cushions have developed, so there's a cushion here, yeah. but will it stay? Um, so it sounds like a lot of that is more mechanical, like it's more stomach and esophageal related, than it does necessarily dysphagia related. But they, they would know that by looking at the swallowing study. So, there are procedures they can do, so you're, you're refluxing a lot, which is why they've got the barrettes and why the stuff is coming up. So there are procedures they can do to tighten that sphincter between the stomach and the esophagus. I'm not, I'm not a GI doctor, but it's... So what happens when there's so much trauma right here at the trachea too? Uh, trauma from eating? After regurgitating it. Oh, it's burning, because you're regurgitating acid, and it burns. And in my situation, um, <laughs> I have problems with the vocal cords that they are now being so compressed. Right. And we do voice therapies. Um, and I've been out of that for a while, but these episodes are very, very traumatic. Yeah. And it sounds really like having in. episodes of, of reflux and aspiration, which is the, the, the primary problem. Sounds like the stuff is coming back up. And with this aspiration, I have IDL. I really don't right. need that to go there right. either. Right. Yeah, no, you've got to, I would definitely keep working with the GI doctor. I had aspiration in the only twice in the last six and a half, and the last time I had to get in the bucket. So, one of the things, at least for me, that might help in here, one, how do you stop talking when you're eating? Rubbing the air away when you're talking, that's one thing. The second thing for me was things like popcorn, mm -hmm. bacon, anything that breaks into little pieces yeah. that doesn't kind of congeal becomes problematic. Nuts. Yeah. Uh, granola. The other thing was eating cereal. Anything with liquid and solid mixed together, e.g., watermelon, cantaloupe, I have to be very careful yeah. that I don't get that liquid and the solid right. going at the same time where part of it wants to trickle down into the trachea. Yeah. Uh, the, does that resonate with yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think that's true. <laughs> With regard to uh, foods for dysphagia, I saw a video recently from Japan, evidently with the aging population there, <laughs> dysphagia is becoming more and more and more tall. Yeah. And it highlighted a company in Japan that's making food especially for dysphagia. So it's uh, processed foods to emulate chicken or beef or whatever. It's shaped, but it's mixed with some, made with some sort of gelatin in the yeah. label that dissolved in the mouth and then flowed down the I recently went for a visit to see my doc from a rheumatologist, and she said that when I walked in, she said, I didn't like the way you sound. I believe that you are developing dysphagia. My problem is, this has been done three, this was three weeks ago. What's happening to me is when I drink water, it's not going down, it's coming out of my nose. Yeah, yeah. So what phase is that? The beginning phase or? It's more than the beginning phase. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, so, I mean, just listening to you talk, um, you can hear that your voice has changed. Yes. <laughs> That's what um, she said. Yeah, you're more nasal, so the air uh, is going up through the nose of it. Um, the liquid's going up through the nose of it because the muscles at the top of the mouth, uh, or the top of the palate, um, are not closing off the way that they're supposed to. Well, that was something subtle that just like, boom, yeah, happened yeah. overnight. Yeah, yeah. That's definitely a good doctor right away. That was a good pickup. So, yeah. <laughs> so what, should, what is the next step? It, so I, I think probably she'll want to get you evaluated by the speech therapist. Um, you know, it, it's, there's a couple different ways to look at it. So there is a conservative way to go, and there are doctors out there, I still actually I tend to try to be conservative, which is don't order tests unless you're going to do something with it. So, you know, if you're not losing weight, you're not aspirating, it doesn't really matter if you're aspirating a bit now, because the answer is, well, what would we do? But again, to me, I think there are things that we would do. So I think this is just such a critical issue 
Um, so maybe it's the head position, maybe it's the texture of your foods, like, like you said, and keep getting you to avoid certain foods. So I think seeing a speech therapist doing the modified variant, seeing what we can do to start things, and then you know, just following it. All right, well, thank you guys. Thank you.